Uh, hello, good afternoon, uh, good evening, or good morning, depending on uh, where you're watching this from. Uh, and uh, welcome to this Carnegie Europe event on football, power, and social change, in which we are going to look at the Qatar World Cup. Uh, my name is Francesco Sicardi. I am a senior research analyst at Carnegie Europe. And I'm joined today by two brilliant colleagues. Let me introduce them to you. Uh, we have Rafka Altelei, who's the editor in chief of Sada, which is an online journal of the Middle East program of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Welcome, Rafia. Thank you. And then we have Ronnie Blaske, who is a German journalist and the author of Power Player, Football in Propaganda, War and Revolution. Welcome, Ronnie. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie, I should mention that your book um, is just out in the English version. So it's really something uh, our listeners should should check out. It's excellent. Um, we're going to be discuss the Qatar World Cup and uh, all the big topics that are in the media right now. But before we dive just into it, just uh, allow me a minute for some housekeeping announcements. Um, you'll be able to field questions on the YouTube chat if you're watching this event from YouTube. And if you're not, you can tweet at Carnegie underscore Europe. In the second part of the event, we'll make sure to, to see your questions and to answer to them. If you don't have a question, that's completely OK. Uh, but you should still keep an eye on the chat box, because that's where my colleagues are going to drop some interesting links for this conversation. And last but not least, let me already thank my colleagues. They're just here in Brussels, next room from me. Uh, this event is possible because of their work. Uh, we usually thank them at the end of the event. But uh, you never know who's around for that. And so we thought we might as well do it at the beginning as well. So thank you. Uh, now, let's start. It's, uh, it's been a couple of busy days when I reached out to Ronnie and Rafia last week. Uh, we knew we'd hand, we would have our hands full, but uh, things really have picked up in the last few days. The, the Football World Cup kicked off in Doha yesterday. Qatar lost 2-0 to Ecuador. It was the first time that the host country lost in the inaugural match of the competition. Uh, England is currently winning in Tehran. It was winning 5-1 um, before we started the live. And uh, Harry Kane, the captain of England, was not wearing the rainbow armband after FIFA threatened uh, repercussions for the players and the teams who would take such decision. Uh, this is just one of uh, the sides that have been so much talked about, about this World Cup. Uh, it's the first time that the World Cup comes to the Middle East. It's, Qatar is the smallest ever country to ever host uh, the World Cup. But uh, despite of that, this is going to be the most watched sporting event of all time. FIFA project, projects uh, 5 billion potential watchers. and You do what you want with that number. Um, it's also going to be the, the, the World Cup with the highest revenue. It's one more billion than uh, what FIFA made out of the Russia World Cup. Now to the criticism, right? Um, the awarding of this World Cup has been uh, tainted by accusations of corruption for at least 12 years since 2010, when on the same day FIFA gave the hosting rights uh, for the tournaments of 2018 to Russia and 2022 to Qatar. Since then, the leadership of FIFA has been wiped away by scandals. Uh, big questions surround the World Cup, this World Cup, from the unfair treatment of migrant worker, workers to the fact that homosexuality is uh, illegal in Qatar and that women's rights and freedom of expression are also uh, limited. Plus, the decision six years ago of switching the tournament from uh, summer to winter time, which is another first. Uh, speaking in Qatar last Sunday, uh, last Saturday, President of FIFA, Gianni Infantino, defended the World Cup, and his basic argument is that uh, Qatar is not perfect, far from it, but it's still better than where it was 12 years ago, and it's still better than many other countries uh, around the world that have recently hosted uh, international sporting events. So uh, that's one of the talking points we're going to discuss it. Uh, Mr. Infantino also said, and I'm paraphrasing it in here, that, that the, the West should look at its own colonial history uh, before it goes around the world giving lessons of morality. And I look forward to knowing what Ronnie and Rafia uh, have to say about that. 
And then in the end, uh, in geopolitical terms, the bottom line of this World Cup is that this tournament has really put Qatar on the map. For Qatar, this is not just another branding exercise, this is an essential piece of a complex strategy to elevate the country internationally. And we're going to take a deeper look on that as well. Now, uh, let me turn to Ronnie to actually um, kick it off with some content. It, it is, of course, not unusual that countries try to polish their international image with a big sporting event. There is even a word for that, and, and that is sports washing. And as with, um, as with many things in life, the, the first one who had uh, this idea was Russian pre President Vladimir Putin. It was him in, uh, back in 20, 2003 that sent his friend Roman Abramovich to, to buy Chelsea FC in the, in the English Premier League. That has been a, a turning point in the, history, in the history of football since then. Uh, tycoons from, from Southeast Asia, as well as leaders of uh, Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab Emirates, in addition to Qatar, have, um, have, have really turned football and football teams into uh, a tool of international influence. But everything pales in comparison with the Qatar World Cup. That's really something on a different scale. So, Ronnie, uh, as someone who watches football and international affairs very closely, can you tell us how did we get here and what's behind this sudden uh, love between Qatar and football and what does this tell us about this World Cup? Yeah, Francesco, thank you for the invitation, for the introduction. Um, this World Cup is in, in many ways a historic tournament. Um, when we see previous World Cups in Germany and South Africa, Brazil and Russia, it was the tournaments were seen as as um, symbols of unity and uh, yes um, they should symbolize the political and the economical value qatar is different in that sense that they are already very wealthy the state is already wealthy as one of the highest uh, um, um, yeah uh, the, the, so people are many of them are very rich but it has I would like to point out two, uh, two reasons why they need this World Cup. The image is one point, yes, but uh, Qatar wants to transform itself. Um, uh, the, the, gas, um, the gas exports will in 10, 15, 20 years not be as important as they are now. So they need tourism, they need investors, they need technologies, they need startups like the other neighbors, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. But more importantly, Qatar is a microstate. It is only around 3 million people and only 10% of them, 300,000, are actually Qatari citizens. And a state that is surrounded by big regional powers like Saudi Arabia and Iran. And there is the, the concern of Qataris that they were not only independent for only 50 years, but they 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 were afraid that the same thing might happen like Kuwait faced in 1990 when they were invaded by Iraq, and in in such a in such an incident, Qatar could not really defend itself because the military is very small. So what do you do? You create soft power, in science, in culture, in economical partnerships, and most prominently in football. The more partnerships you have, Al Jazeera, the news channel, uh, the education city, a campus of Western universities, Paris Saint Germain. And now the World Cup, the more uh, visible you are, the less likely you get invaded. And that is, uh, that is, I think, the most important part. And now there we are. Now there is the World Cup and everybody talks about Qatar. And, and we see there is another regional power in the Middle East. Uh, that's a great uh, introduction. I wonder if you could tell our viewers a little bit more, if you can, could elaborate a little bit more on the strategies that Qatar has um, developed to, to, to get where they are now. Uh, PSG, you mentioned, is one, of, uh, is one team, but there has been a massive domestic investment in um, growing up a football team, which is actually up to the task now. Uh, apparently, it wasn't. Um, as well as a big push for um, controlling broadcasting rights internationally, as well as Qatar is, is very well located in the European football environment to actually uh, control key positions of it. The president of Paris Saint-Germain, for example, has a lot of power. So could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Russia and Putin and, and uh, one sponsor that we should name is Gazprom. So it is a state energy supplier of Russia, which doesn't really need advertising in, 
in Europe I didn't need because it has already enough money. But uh, with with the help of Gazprom, Russia was able to build channels into Western uh, politics beyond the normal protocol. So Gazprom was a sponsor, Chalke 04, at UEFA, at Red Star Belgrade, and a gas manager that is already in the boardroom of, of, of a football club in the VIP lounge of a stadium. You can maybe... Um, talk about um, controversial pipeline projects like Nord Stream 2 in Germany. You can talk uh, in the football stadium where it's more emotional, it's more casual. You could, you could easily talk politics. And Qatar uh, followed up on that. Um, I mean, the United Arab Emirates started even before. Etihad, the state line from Abu Dhabi, which owns um, Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi owns Manchester City successfully, not only Manchester City, other clubs in the world as well. Emirates, uh, the airline of Dubai, they own or they were sponsored Real Madrid, Arsenal London, Hamburger SV, other clubs in Europe. So it is with a sponsor, with football, you create reasons to talk politically, economically, and you secure you secure um, influence. You secure influence that you need politically and for your security uh, politics. And Qatar, Qatar followed up on that very strategically. And, and not only in the in, in the West, by the way, they have uh, very different different projects. They had 12 years time to to organize the World Cup. Corruption is a big topic, and we are discussing why did they get the World Cup. It is not the it's um, it perhaps it was, but uh, I wouldn't say corruption is uh, putting envelopes with money under hotel room door. Maybe that happened too. We don't know. But if, look at 2010 when the decision was made. Um, Nicolas Sarkozy, back then French president, supposedly mad. Uh, the Emir, uh, the Emir's son, uh, and Michel Platini, back then the UEFA president, and it, It was not a coincidence that during that time Qatar bought um, bought uh, fighting jets from France. It was not it was not a coincidence that Qatar Airways extended its routes to Latin America, where where um, the FIFA uh, members said who took the decision on the World Cup. So it was always related to economy. And now, when that is that is interesting too, uh, Qatar is a small society, 300,000 people. Uh, they're wealthy. There's not the motivation to to become rich because of football, um, but they have one of the most modern sports center, the Aspire Academy, and they had 12 years to create a football team, a national football team that wasn't that great uh, yesterday. It won the Asian Cup three years ago. So what do you do? The, the, the Many of the players are children of immigrants. So the parents came from Sudan, Somalia, Yemen 10, 15 years ago, and they are now the Qatari team. They are naturalized, but they don't really enjoy all the privileges that Qatari citizens enjoy. So there's a hierarchy of citizenship. Um, to summarize, Qatar is a, in many ways a facade society. When I walked Not only in the sports center, I visited the education city, I visited the Museum of Islamic Art. It is impressive, not only the architecture, but the content as well. And that put Qatar on the map. And what I, what I find fascinating too is they talk to everyone. They have relations to Iran because they share the biggest gas field. They talk to the US because US has one of their most important military bases in Qatar. They have back channel contacts to Israel. They talk to Hamas in the Gaza Strip. So they put foreign policy on a new level with the help of football. And we as Westerners have to deal with it, no matter if we want or not. The state will be influential and important in the years to come. All right, uh, great. Let me let me then turn to Rafia to to look at at, at the domestic dimension, maybe a little bit more. Rafia, um, you have lived in Qatar for for five years. Um, there's been a lot of bad press about this World Cup. Obviously, uh, we will probably never know how many uh, migrant workers uh, actually died in 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 the construction of everything that Qatar needed to run a successful World Cup. We, we very well know it's probably more than three, which is the number that uh, FIFA president and Qatar are giving out to the press, um, three as the number of migrant workers that died directly uh, building, uh, building stadiums, whereas the Guardian reports that up to, up to 6,500 uh, people have lost their lives in Qatar. Um, since the World Cup has been awarded in, in, uh, in 2010. So this has been uh, one big topic that uh, the media has covered, uh, persecution of same-sex uh, unions or same-sex relations. It's obviously another big topic uh, that has been on, 
on the list, but I wonder if, if that's all that there is uh, to say about this or uh, if, it's, if we're missing a part of the picture when, when, we, when we focus on these things. Um, you can always turn the, you can turn this around and say and see the glass half full in a way and, 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 and refer to uh, the, the progress that Qatar has made on, on, uh, on worker rights uh, and in cooperation with international labor organization as well as the discussions that the Qatari elite is having on, on same, sexual, same sex union and LGBTQI rights are unthinkable just a few years ago. So uh, I wonder if you could uh, help us navigate this all and, and tell us what you think about this. Uh, first, thank you for the invitation and giving me this opportunity to uh, be part of this discussion, which I think is very important, especially on the level of uh, human rights and um, social change. Um, in fact, it's sad, of course, that the record of human rights, it's not good um, in Qatar, uh, especially uh, regarding the migrant workers, because I think this is the biggest human rights problem, in fact, in Qatar. And maybe in most of the Gulf countries, but then it's, uh, it, it has been the main human rights issue um, in the media, especially in the West media, but also in the human rights organizations, which um, in fact had a lot of reports about these issues, uh, about this specific issue. Um, having said that, um, I think the World Cup was an opportunity of course, to highlight issues of human rights, um, um, whether it's women rights, migrants rights, or LGBTQ um, uh, um, rights. However, I think um, the Western media generally went too far in criticizing Qatar um, for hosting the World Cup while having this uh, uh, human rights record. Um, how is that perceived in the region? that the Western media is so biased because, for example, in 2018 and 2014, when Brazil and Russia um, hosted uh, the World Cup, they didn't face such relentless campaign against them on human rights, while they have also very bad human rights um, uh, record. And um, people think because Qatar is an Arab and Muslim country, unfortunately, the West choose what is good and how it should be representing the maybe the world or the World Cup. So Rani mentioned that the World Cup is um, an opportunity, a chance for unity, and it's usually unite the world, um, you know, under the football. And um, as a soft power, um, Football has been always a, a good tool to unite the, the world. But since like 2010, since Qatar um, got the bid for the World Cup, this um, campaign was free, free, uh, so disappointing, I have to say, because it didn't help in... One, I would, I would like to talk about two direction. It didn't help in one, in one direction to um, accept the West criticism because many people thought that the this criticism, in some of it, especially I have to say, when it comes to LGBTQ, it's against their value, their um, uh, teachings, and they think. And the social change wouldn't happen like during uh, three weeks of uh, World Cup or if the uh, rainbow flag was raised in the, um, in the arenas. Social change needs time. And I think the Western media could have helped Qatari, Qataris or people who live in Qatar uh, by raising the awareness about human rights in a different way. Basically, people thought that all this campaign is to deprive Qatar from this World Cup, from hosting the World Cup, or at least to fail in hosting it and presenting it in the way they want it. So other issue, for example, when they talk about alcohol, of course, you know, the country is majority of Muslim people. And so the alcohol itself, it's available in the hotels and where people would live. 
the people who are coming to visit Qatar. So why it is a big issue to have it, for example, in arena or everywhere um, to have it available. The thing is, FIFA, when they, regardless of the corruption, how it happened, knew that Qatar is a Muslim country, not allowing alcohol, for example, um, in um, public, in many public places other than hotels, maybe. Um, so this is part of the deal. I don't think that FIFA or any organization should put term terms that are profoundly against the culture of the country hosting the, 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 the event. So I think if we go back to the idea of unity, the Middle East didn't or never given the opportunity to be a symbol of peace. And I think Qatar, of course, is part of the diplomacy, part of the international relation. By hosting this World Cup, it gave an opportunity to show the Middle East, the entire region, and not only the Arab uh, countries, but also the Islamic country, to see them as a peaceful or um, at least a place where can the world, in fact, unite and come and enjoy one common thing, that is their love for football. Foot, football. But again, I think when I say the West, European and America, American media didn't give, didn't allow even the people in that region to feel happier, to feel maybe more uh, sympathetic with even the values they are talking about, with the human rights, which is, I think rightly should be announced and, and talked about. But then this campaign, I think it was diverted from its you know, main goal to level up the awareness, raise the awareness, or to highlight violations, of course, to a different scale, which is failing this World Cup. That's why what we see now in the media, in the Arab media and the Islamic media, that Qatar is the only Islamic and Arab country hosting. It's for them, of course, this is big achievement, not only for Qatar, for the whole region. Now, uh, Roni also mentioned that Qatar feared, and this is true, as a small country uh, that will be colonized. And that happened, in fact, in 2016, when the Gulf countries actually almost, uh, Qatar, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab Emirates, um, along with Bahrain and Egypt, you know, boy boycotted Qatar, and they were about to. So they knew, of course, being a small state, they needed other tools to protect themselves. Um, it wasn't only the football, of course, uh, but also the conferences. You know, Qatar has been um, holding uh, conferences, and this is another diplomacy, soft, uh, soft uh, power, where they um, invited people from around the world to, to, to discuss many issues. So yes, Qatar is the small country and now is hosting the biggest event in the world. And I think the, the West should give Qatar and the Arab world an opportunity to show the best they have, not only to you know, highlight the issues that are bad about the Middle East. I don't think there is a perfect country. I don't defend that there um, isn't serious human rights problems in Qatar. But then I think the West went too far in criticizing Qatar for hosting this. If there was a corruption, if that was the main reason, I think FIFA should be, you know, um, uh, the, the responsible for this criticism more than Qatar itself. Yeah, and I think we have uh, we've seen a lot of, of those arguments in um, in Western media as well. I was reading, I think, an Economist piece, but also in the New York Times the other day, like long uh, uh, reflections on the the football inheritance that 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 the Middle East actually has. And, and Ronnie has written about this. Maybe we'll ask him about it later in the discussion. But Rafia, can can I ask you then um, if that was how this was treated in the West? Uh, how did that trickle down in the Arab world? Was actually how do how do the other Arab countries look at Qatar now? Did did the World Cup um, improve their standing in in the region? You see, um, yeah, I followed this, of course, from the very beginning, and I was in Qatar from two thousand and fifteen until two thousand and nineteen. So I, 
so how um, first Interly, I think I should mention this because Ronnie also mentioned that Qatar is a rich country and didn't need this economically. But then that helped, in fact, the country to uh, um, to um, do a fast uh, a speed uh, um, a speed up the development in the country. So since 2010, uh, during the past 12 years, you know that the, the country in infrastructure has changed. Um, and I was there last summer and I could see the roads, the buildings, everything new because they wanted to um, uh, uh, to be ready for the World Cup. But then this infrastructure is there to stay in the country. Um, also, the banking system, the health system and the e-government system, all they advance very quickly just because of this uh, World Cup hosting. But then this will remain in the country. And I think this uh, um, in the as in, inside the country it's itself. Um, uh, you know, even they had the money, they didn't do that before. They did it because of this occasion, because they wanted to, to be seen uh, at the level of, you know, uh, modern and advanced countries, which that was very, very successful, I think. So um, for yesterday, watching the ceremony, the opening ceremony, um, uh, I saw Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the Crown Prince of uh, Saudi Arabia, um, walking with uh, Sheikh Tamim, uh, the Emir of Qatar, who were like few years ago, you know, um, almost um, in war. And uh, um, Mohammed bin Rashid Maktoub, the ruler of Dubai, uh, sent his, uh, you know, greetings for the great opening and ceremony and all these things. So what I think also on the level of the rulers, even if they have or had problems between them, um, the World Cup, in fact, helped um, them to come a little bit closer. I hope that will, uh, you know, um, also be reflected on the politics between the country and the geopolitics of the countries. But um, on the level of the people, um, what I noticed that everyone <laughs> I know and everyone I don't know, uh, and some journalists, they in fact put their impressions about us, regardless what happened between the countries, what how they view Qatar, they think this event is their event. This is an Arab and, uh, you know, uh, uh, not only Arab, actually, and Islamic. It's broader. And they feel proud that is happening, um, you know, in, in their lands close to them. And not only this, they actually wanted um, this to succeed because they wanted the world to see them differently. They are big fans of football. They like football. They, um, you know, they just wanted to be uh, with the rest of the world in, in, in this occasion. I know many people, uh, for example, uh, they came from different uh, Gulf countries, neighboring countries, or from other Arab countries to stay with their families during the World Cup because they thought that this is a big international event. They want to be remembered, um, you know, over the years. So one more thing uh, I would like to add is the social change. Um, this campaign from the Western, from the Western uh, um, media, I think it helped also Arab journalists and Arab generally people to see the problems um, of human rights, not as internal issue. I think this is very positive. It's an international issue and it matters for other people around the world. And I think that would help the people, the activists, of human rights inside the country, inside Qatar, to be more empowered and they more seen and more heard inside the country. Because I do believe any social change, if it is going to happen, it will happen just because of the people are active on the ground inside the country. I have just, I wonder after the World Cup and everything, uh, you know, went well, hopefully in the, uh, in the, um, uh, during the next three weeks, would many of the uh, journalists and the West uh, and the media, uh, Western media, would continue raising the issues of human rights in Qatar and in the Gulf? This is main question, because if they care deeply about this issue, I think they should continue raising these in this event and other events. But then they don't. They shouldn't expect that they have this huge campaign during the World Cup and um, they will see change right away happening. Um, I will leave that for the next discussion. I think you will ask me about um, 
other issues related to the maybe the double standard um, and we can talk about it later. Yeah, maybe just a quick follow up on what you just said is that um, what well, we, of course, uh, as Ronnie said, it's 300,000 Qataris, right? It's, it's not too many of them. And we tend to think of them as a block, but we're probably many mm -hmm. different, like the population is probably split mm -hmm. along different um, political orientations. So I, I, I was wondering um, if it's not like it, w w Qatar is a country that obviously also has problems or opposition is not really possible, like political rights are restricted. So maybe if what what is in which way the, the World Cup is, is helping also people who would be in opposition in Qatar uh, in like make progress on political rights or on freedom of assembly okay, or the, freedom of speech. Okay, thank you. Actually, there are a few people who are in jail now in Qatar because of their position from the late uh, the latest elections held in Qatar. Uh, and um, no one, I didn't actually see any of the Western media raise this. They are prominent people, they are lawyers, they are professors or people holding, um, you know, PhDs and things, and they have profound issues with the, uh, excluding um, uh, one tribe from the elections, um, do historical issues. So anyway, nobody, in fact, talked about this issue, and this is very important um, uh, in Qatar. So there are people, there are groups in, in Qatar, they are not seen because they are not maybe loud enough, but also, as you mentioned, the population, the Qatari population itself is very small, it's around 300,000 uh, people. But, you know, being there for five years, I could see that there are many groups, even if they don't talk loudly, you know, about human rights, but there are some small organizations helping people. But of course, if we talk about uh, women issues, LGBTQ, there isn't any formation of any kind of um, organi organizations um, uh, in the land. Uh, but I don't know, in fact, um, if there are, for example, women, uh, there are some government uh, organizations work on women issues, but then the women um, rights, for example, in there, um, I wouldn't, they are not so so severe. They, not like it was in the Saudi Arabia where women couldn't drive or they need guardians for um, everything they do. They have certain issues like women still cannot pass their nationalities to um, their children. They, they, not by the law, unfortunately, it's by the authority of the social, um, you know, um, social authorities more than it's like a, a policy um, of the state that women cannot do a lot of things without the permissions, of course, with the, of their husbands or their, uh, you know, parents or a male, a male guardian. But then if women choose differently, they can, in fact, do um, uh, what they want, but then they have to, um, be ready for the consequences from their family, but the, there will not be um, like a legal um, action taken against them. So again, I would like to emphasize one thing. I don't think is Qatar or all the Gulf countries, in fact, have the freedom of press, have the freedom of expression, have the freedom of association, have the freedom of uh, assembly. They all restricting this very much and they have a um, uh, bad record in human rights, specifically on these issues. And I wish that the um, Western media highlighted these issues more than they go too far on issues. They are in fact not affecting um, many people, let's put it this way, in the country. All right. uh, thank you. Uh, Ronnie, back to you. Um, I'm curious to think what, what, are, what you actually think about all this. Are we, are we, is it fair to criticize Qatar and maybe we have been focusing on the wrong things, but also you're German, of course. So Germany has been one of the the German national team, um, the one of the one of the key figures in your football movement, uh, Philippe Lam, the, the former um, captain of the national team, has been very has been quite outspoken on this, and so have the fans in in, in German stadium. So. I would just take. I would. I just like to ask for for your personal opinion and view on on these topics, and then if you could report a little bit on what the mood in Germany. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, 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 I need to say that the the term campaign of the Western 
media I don't really like because the term campaign insinuates that we all have a conspiracy here and we organized and and organized this campaign. That's not true. I was um, traveling to Qatar three times. I was traveling the region and I specifically tried to differentiate and to criticize Qatar for the right reasons, the human rights violations, uh, the guardianship of women um, that uh, homosexuals face um, prison and possibly violence um, that the migrant workers, um, it's, it's very difficult for them. But on the other, on the other hand, Germany uh, is not really that critical anymore. It's government because soon we probably depend on um, gas deliveries from Qatar because uh, we were dependent on Russia. But after the war, after the war starting in Ukraine, that is over now. And in general, Qatar has invested more than $300 billion dollars in Western markets, especially in Britain, in the UK, um, in France, in the US. So three of the permanent members of the UN Security Council, and they, they Harrods, Sainsbury, Barclays, Credit Suisse, so main and prestigious company, Qatar has invested in France, in Germany. Um, German companies benefited massively from the new metro, from houses, from machines. So economically ties are, are very important. During the blockade uh, that, that uh, Rafael mentioned, um, Chancellor Merkel, uh, then Chancellor Merkel, um, was welcoming the EMEA in 2018. And just recently, our chancellor was visiting um, Qatar. So the, the, the outragement in the media is very different from the um, per percep perception of the of the government. And if you look at the, the headline, Qatar supports terrorism, that's another topic here. Um, yes, they have um, contact with the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes, they have contact to Hamas. Yes, they have contact to Hezbollah. But um, when you ask people in the, in the foreign ministry here, they say, better talk to Qatar as a mediator, better um, negotiate the withdrawal of the US troops from Afghanistan in Doha, not in Kabul. So you have a mediator in between. So very important is to c criticize Qatar for the right reason. But I, would, I wouldn't say it's a campaign. It's a lack of knowledge. When, when somebody gives me time to explain that, and it costs 20, 30 minutes, right? Um, most of my lectures, people say, oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. So there are more uh, dependencies. There are more um, uh, ties. And, um, and, and the, the, of course, there is a taboo to sell weapons to Qatar. There is a taboo of sell. I mean, they did in many years, but they shouldn't do it anymore. But where can you work together with Qatar? For example, healthcare. Qatar, 17% of the people live with diabetes. More than 50 uh, are, are obese um, because sports and, and physical activity is not that established. Germany can help with their sports system. Renewable energies, green uh, and, and, and um, green energies. And, and so um, energy... Um, garbage management. So in many ways, these, these nations can work together. And this massive criticism from parts of the media, not all media, from parts of the media, uh, can actually lead to, to, to anger at the Emir. When Gary Lineker, for example, the English football icon, uh, tries, to, he, he, motivate, he wanted to motivate English players to come out as gay in Qatar only for his headline. It doesn't make any sense because the, the frustration, uh, um, Qatar, who, who, who will feel it at the end? The already marginalized group. When the Emir uh, did uh, prohibit beer two days before kickoff, now the armband, which is prohibited one day, one day before kickoff, that's the middle finger of the Emir to the Western media, right? Because he can do that. And uh, uh, we know it's a region of strong men. Uh, I told before that the Emir doesn't want to lose its face in front of Mohammed bin Salman. Um, it's a region that we should uh, watch closely. And they're not doing everything for us, right? So if you look at the most important uh, gas um, uh, customers, Japan, India, China, India, uh, Japan, South Korea, China, India, um, again, other countries of Latin America, Asia, they're not criticizing Qatar. It is a European phenomenon. And if we do want to change Qatar, we should look for allies, we should be constructive, we should be differentiated, we should uh, reflect our dependencies, our motivations. It's complicated, and football is not a complicated match. It's easy, the, the one with the most goal wins, so it doesn't really match the easy, simple world of football and the complex geopolitics. Can, can I comment on what Ronnie said? So of thank course. you for mentioning this. Um, um, it's very important, and uh, I should have clarified that when I meant a campaign that it it is how it is uh, perceived in there you see and i do uh, differentiate in fact between 
the governments of the of the west of europe and america and uh, the organization the media the let's say the independent and free media which we don't have in fact in the middle east um so i really appreciate that but then um i was telling more about how people perceiving this um you know because they see it as a campaign that is dedicated to fa- to um you know to, to make this uh, event or this um, uh, world cup in qatar to, to fail but then yes it, qatar is not the only party you know to blame also uh, on many many issues because it is complicated as you mentioned uh, qatar didn't want of course economic benefit from it like most of the countries hosting the or hosted already um the world cup but then it was to just make its image in the world better and then it needs help um but then there are ina- enablers you know other states so for us also in the middle east we would like very much to be different from to be talked about and to be mentioned as different from our governments because we have our own uh, independent thinking and um we don't approve whatever our government um government's doing so yes you know the the, the i think myself you uh, know there are uh, maybe um in the gulf region like um saudi arabia and united arab emirates um specifically they are looking at this world cup uh, closely and it's maybe um with um lots of cautious to um uh, i don't think the relations are um perfect between these countries and then as you mentioned um they are not doing this all for you for like the westerns uh, you know in europe and america but they also they look in, inside the region and they want to locate um uh, uh, themselves in a position that they cannot be harmed from countries in the regions um as close as saudi arabia and emirates and iran for example but then at the same time they want to be friends to the world mentioning hamas and hezbollah also is another controversial issues because uh, many people in the region also see hezbollah and hamas as uh, resistance groups against israel you know we cannot forget this main aspect so having them uh, they have of course relation with muslim muslim brotherhood during uh, late uh, pre- egyptian uh, president um, morsi you know that was a main issue between egypt and uh, and qatar and uh, many egyptians other than the state uh, i mean the government they were against qatar in fact because of respecting uh, of hosting muslim brotherhood uh, members but then as you said it was used at back channels even taliban itself and this is even the united state of america in fact approved this thing because they wanted you know um a channel to these groups uh whether they called them terrorist group uh, or you know resistant group or whatever groups but they are existing groups and they need to deal with them like united state even taliban didn't want to talk they consider it of course but then finally it became now the state um you know uh, afghanistan itself is a state ruled by the taliban itself and in fact qatar helped in in many talks between the united state and taliban and even hosting the people who supported the united state um before coming to the us um they were in al udaid you mentioned this huge uh, big uh, american military uh, base base in uh, in qatar so it is complicated but then um overall i would like to say that regardless of the what qatar you know strategic goal as a, a state wants there is aspect of the football and the world cup that we shouldn't um is, escape or ignore that is we try as journalists you know people who have you know um the power or the people who have an opportunity to say something and listen to is that to try also to unite the world at least in these five, three week uh, three weeks and then we can highlight still or continue highlight the major important issues and we think we can help the people of this country whether it is qatar or another country right um i think uh, that that that's enough complexity for for one day but Uh, probably but uh, Ronnie I wanted to get back to you and before we we have a few questions uh, from from our audience but there is one key player that has not been named and that's of course FIFA um I was wondering if um 
you could tell us a little bit about uh, the role FIFA is playing in all this, right? In, in the end, as I think you said it at the beginning, if, if there are allegations of corruption, they, they're about FIFA as much as they are about Qatar. And there is the FIFA that awarded Qatar the World Cup, that was in 2010, and there is the FIFA that is running it now. And in between, you have had this massive corruption um, scandal that has turned the organization uh, upside down. FIFA now seems to be a lot more, you know, out like forward coming uh, about the role that football should play internationally to promote, uh, you know, a positive social inclusion policies. But at the same time, it's a massive economic and financial operation for them, and it, it doesn't say anywhere that football is, needs to be a force for from good unless it's the leaders who who steer it in that direction. So, um, how do you assess? Uh, FIFA's position in all of this, also with an eye to the World Cup that are coming, the yeah. one in North America and possibly another one in China. It's uh, a sport itself to criticize FIFA in Germany and you know everything about FIFA. So for me, I, I always would like to think constructively, how can it be reformed? And when 2015, the big scandal, Loretta Lynch, the Justice Department of the US starting this big investigation, when even that did not change FIFA, I don't know what can. And they changed the, the rule for, for awarding the World Cup. FIFA has 211 members, more than the United Nations. Um, even Palestine, which is not, which is not a UN-recognized state, has its own national team. So it has a political impact. And I've traveled many countries um, in Africa and Asia where FIFA is seen very differently. I was in Namibia a few months ago and a few thousand dollars uh, development aid from FIFA means a new house for the football federation. And Namibia has the same vote as the big German or English football federation. Um, uh, with all the scandals, Western sponsors withdraw. There's only at the moment one, one uh, European sponsor, which is Adidas. But all these global companies, uh, Adidas as well, even though they have they, they are based in a very small city in Germany, they want to sell their products in, in all uh, countries, in Saudi Arabia, in Israel, politically different countries. They are global powers. That's why they are very... Um, um, they don't really... Uh, engage in political debates as long as it's not harming their, their product. And nowadays, companies withdrawing there now. I just watched England against China. You see Wanda, you see Chinese, um, Chinese symbols, uh, Chinese companies, other ones are waiting uh, because the power is shifting to the east and it doesn't mean that FIFA will go, will go down. Uh, Johnny Infantina survives everything. I'm not sure the World Cup, uh, how, how much um, now uh, the, the people yesterday leaving the, the stadium before the final whistle, we have the armband debate. I don't know if it could lead to such a big outragement that it could um, be critical for Infantino. I don't think so, because there are the, the big, and, and we I have practically every day such a critical event like here, but the, the huge majority of football fans they are followers of tiktok of instagram i'm not sure if they of if we can reach them all so um we can we we can criticize and bash fifa as long as we want this system did not fail in the past years and i'm skeptical that it will in the years to come right um we have questions from our audience, so I'll, I'll just read one out uh, for you both. But we're we are ten minutes from from the end of, of our event, so I'll I'll ask you to to be relatively brief in, in your answers. Uh, let's start with, from with well, from this one. Um, Will Qatar soft power be able to partially greenwash its oil industry, or is that unlikely to have any impact over the climate process? Or inactions that are happening throughout the world. So, um, is uh, we, we've spoken about economic diversification, but Rafia, can you maybe start with this one? I um, didn't understand the question. In fact, I uh, if, will Qatar bring will soft power enable Qatar to turn around its oil industry? or to diversify the economy, I guess, to an extent. You know, this that... diversification of uh, revenues or income uh, rev uh, sources is like, um, it's the thing in the Gulf now, you know, in the all, all, all countries. Um, and so they, they all have these visions 
to uh, diversify their uh, you know income and um, uh, Qatar um, has limited sources. Uh, Ronnie mentioned talked about this before. They have the oil. They they have the gas. But mainly the gas is their you know um, uh, one accord, uh, a commodity of revenue. But then tourism is there. But then um, still Qatar is a small country. I don't know um, you know and. Let's see how the World Cup will end and how many people maybe in the next year will uh, uh, work. But then um, uh, now many of the, yeah, any few of the countries in the Gulf, they think of, you know, the uh, the different technologies, uh, in fact. Um, but maybe Ronnie is more, um, yeah. you know, experienced in this issue. <laughs> he can talk better than me. I did some research about the so-called most sustainable World Cup that Qatar presents. It's a PR fairy tale, I would say. They have eight stadiums in a small country. A few of them are um, have an air conditioning system. Um, Qatar depends on gas uh, exports. Um, so they didn't do much in renewable energies. Uh, they have built now one solar, uh, solar, solar panel um, um, machine or whatever you put it in English. But uh, at the end, I'm not sure or maybe that this World Cup can people make think about the climate crisis. Um, Qatar works with climate compensation, so they build thousands and thousands of trees and plants, but they use water from the sea that has to... Uh, uh, with, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is, it is a per, per, uh, I don't know in English, uh, but it is um, uh, not very eco-friendly country and maybe the world cup can change it a little bit so the quest the, the the answer to the question is yes they need they use the world cup to um uh, greenwash their their gas economy right um two questions from cornelius Adebar, our uh, carnegie colleague um for rafia these are about uh, these are about iran so mm -hmm. rafia uh what do qataris think about the revolt in iran and do they openly talk about it um, do players of, for example, uh, players of Team Melli not singing the national anthem in protest? So regarding Iran, um, uh, people in, in Qatar and <laughs> in the Gulf, I think they talk about it with cautious because the issue of hijab itself, it's a, you know, a, a, sensitive, a sensitive issue because um, there are lots of activists I saw on the social media specifically. They agree that women should 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 have a choice in um, wearing hijab or not wearing hijab. Then, but then we do understand that these um, you know protests they are more than about women choice or women wearing hijab or not wearing hijab or about the morality police. It's more about the um, the Islamic State regime. Uh, the Iranians now continuing this uh, these protests, um, asking for. Um, uh, the regime uh, to change. Uh, they don't want any more uh, Islamic State, um, you know, regime in Iran. Um, I think uh, you know, the media in Qatar is cautious a lot in talking about this because they want to maintain um, good, uh, relatively, uh, relatively uh, relationship with Iran. And from the people side, it's also they cannot. Um, many they cannot say. Um, freely, let's say, and um, without uh, being criticized that women should choose not to wear hijab if they want to. So this is from the social, religious side of it. But yeah. then uh, I know like Jazeera and other media, um, they will be very cautious in discussing issues that are directly against the, the Islamic State. Right. And, and then Ronnie, um... You, you wrote a, a chapter of your book about Iran, so you're, this is going to be a, a good question for you. How consequential can the players' uh, protests be in a country with highly politicized sport? Do you expect this to wait on the team's performance during the tournament? I'm talking about the Iranian team, of course. Yeah, when I saw the players um, not singing the anthem uh, two hours ago, and uh, I think a few of them had tears in their eyes, and you had um, people in the stands having tears in their eyes, and a few of them were booing and out of the stadium, people were were mourning or thinking of their people and victims in Iran. That is a, that is a topic we should talk about, not about a ridiculous armband. And um, yes, um, how, what, how can you protest when your family or friends are threatened in Iran? Uh, what is possible? And we have um, impressive people not singing the anthem, not celebrating goals, being critical on social media. Uh, doing doing gestures, all kinds of symbols, risking their existence, risking their lives. 
that is that is very impressive and uh, it was it's interesting in the history that football was always a, a tool for the reformist powers in in iran and i remember um i i read a lot about it the match in 1997 when iran qualified for the world cup and hundred thousands of people were were on the streets of tehran and the regime was shocked that this was possible and football could mobilize that many people and they're a bit afraid of this happening now as well even though the the atmosphere is not like this and when the president was was welcoming the team uh, last week ibrahim rahisi then the players are closely observed interpreted it is nearly impossible to play a, a good world cup because they're they're football players but they're more and more ambassadors of their state of the opposition of the government every person of iran puts a projection on this team so this is this is almost impossible to to play well during the circumstances yeah and um this is a nice way to almost finish it but ronnie maybe i i wanted to turn to you one last time um uh, it's also a little bit uh, to, to, to promote, to promote your, your wonderful book. Um, where your book is full of, of, of nice stories of, of, of football as a way to be a vector of protest, a vector of hope, but also a, an instrument of repression. So I, if there may be one story you'd like to share, or like some examples of that that can leave us with a happy and uh, hopeful <laughs> note as we as we look at the next four weeks of World Cup. Yeah, we tend to be negative. Me as a journalist, I always catch myself being too negative. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Middle East history, the last century in the Arab world is filled, of, filled with positive, optimistic stories. Not only that, Algeria, for example, used football to um, uh, yeah, make the independence movement against France in the 50s um, more public. We had um, Iraq sensationally winning the Asian Cup in 2007 after this country was torn by terror and war they were winning the Asian Cup and and at least for a few days for a few weeks this this um, this country with 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 Shiites and, and Sunnis and Kurds was was united um, I mentioned the national team of Palestine that um, gay gives the its its people at least a little bit of, of the feeling that they are they are a state and um, yeah and, and now we we have um uh, at least two teams from 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 north africa tunisia and morocco and and these these countries suffer as well after the hope after the arab spring that there might um, be a democracy which is fragile and difficult and and football gives 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 hope gives gives their opportunity for, for people, different different ethnicities, religions to talk. There's always a reason to talk. Syria, for example, right? Even that Bashar al-Assad used football even during war to simulate normality. And then he used stadiums for, for tanks and weapons. But no, football fans use it well to, to, to stay sane, to have something to look forward to to distract themselves from, from big concerns. And I was wondering myself, after all this research, how many optimistic, constructive, positive people and examples we find in the Middle East. And I, I, I unfortunately, I miss that in, in, in many Western media. I, I have to look for, 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 for books, for, for other media to, to find these stories. Unfortunately, they're not that present. And my editors and, and my newspapers, it was sometimes difficult to convince them to cover more of these topics. Hopefully there, there will be more of these stories in the upcoming four weeks. Yes, let's hope for that. So I think it's a wonderful place to, to leave our audience. Um, Ronnie, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today. Our Players is the book. Uh, Rafia, thanks to you as well for, for your comments and insights from Qatar. Uh, thank you again for the, for the, to the Kani colleagues that made this event possible here, here in Brussels, but also in, in Beirut and in Washington. And uh, thanks to our viewers for their attention. And until next time. Thank you. Thank you.